share those value premises that you mentioned, but obviously not everybody does. But, but, but and, Peter, and why, why can't you do the same thing? Why can't you attack the philosophical underpinnings of medicine the same way? Mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're continually vomiting, you should, you should go to the doctor and get X, Y, and Z. But that just assumes you don't want to continually vomit. Yeah, it does. But exactly. What, what about, the, as, what as, about as, the person as, who as, wants to continually vomit? But that's that's an assumption. I mean, your example was if I want to live longer, then I should. But not everybody does okay, want to okay. live longer. But right? that's shorthand that's, that's, for all, a whole suite of concerns uh, that everyone recognizes are uh, the only intelligible discussion about human health. And now the, fa the fa and and the, if we can find one person who says, "Listen, I like vomiting. I like continuous pain, and I'd like to die tomorrow." He's not, he's not offering an alternate medical health-based worldview that we have to take seriously. He just doesn't get invited back to the conference about medicine. But <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so, and so, so it could be with is, the conference on morality, that's all. But I'm look, I, I do spend time at conferences where we discuss the technological imperative, the fact that you now have more recruitment that can prolong people's lives. Should you use it? I mean, that's an ethical question that medicine doesn't really help you to uh, answer. No, okay, but that's, that's, that's a false use of my analogy. I'm not saying medicine can answer these things. I'm saying that question of whether we should use medicine in this way is intelligible in a larger space where we talk about human well-being. So it's, it's intelligible, but it's not answered. Yeah, right. Well, no, it, it's hard. It, it, could be, it could be hard to answer. There, there are an infinite number of scientifically coherent questions that we will never answer and we can't answer. The one, my favorite, which I use all the time now, is what was JFK thinking the moment he got shot? Okay, mm. we have no idea, but this is a, this is a well-posed question. It has an answer, and we don't know it, but we know it, what it wasn't. I mean, he wasn't thinking about string theory. He wasn't thinking... You don't know that. He, I, I know that, and, and <laughs> I'll tell you what I, what I do know. He wasn't thinking, I wonder if Sam Harris is going to use me as an example at this early. conference. Yeah. He wasn't. Simon, um, uh, just, just answer for me, if you would, uh, Lawrence's point about the, uh, his a, historist, a historical point there. I, uh, yeah. I remember yeah, a review I was, you did of Bernard Williams' you. books where you talked precisely about the need, the need yes. for the historical yes. perspective. Yes, I know, it's terrible. You know, science, I mean, science now is being used by Lawrence in the narrow sense that he explicitly said he wasn't using it in. Um, namely, it's the physicists and chemists who don't read stuff that's a year old, more than a year old. Um, and I think he's very wise. He probably shouldn't read Shakespeare or Tolstoy or Aristotle or Hume or Darwin. These are all, all well over a century old. And of course, they've got absolutely nothing to tell us about life. <laughs> absolutely nothing. <laughs> and the, well, that, and the, reason, the reason he shouldn't read them is that you have to come to read something with a mind which is prepared to accept it. I'm sorry that uh, Sam has come to ethics with its own vocabulary, meta-ethics, emotivism, expressivism, and so on, obviously determined to find it boring. And I'm sure he well, can no, find it boring. No, not determined, no. And many people come to Shakespeare and find it boring, and many people listen to Beethoven and find it boring. And there is no argument that will stop them, and that's part of Hume's point about reason. Bernard Williams, a great moral philosopher, once said that, um, <clears throat> There's a holy grail that some people have, which is to find the argument that will stop them in their tracks when they come to take you away. Now, I, it's perfectly true, for, uh, Hume thought there was no such argument. Mm. And I believe you can know as much science as you could ever find out, and you'll still not find the argument that will stop them in their tracks when they come to take you away. Well, we haven't, that's we the, haven't the point the about the, That's the point about the Isort gap. And that's the point about not being able to derive morals from reason. But, that, but that's a move you can't make in any other domain of knowledge. We have not found the argument that will convince a majority of the American people that evolution is a fact. 25% okay, agree that evolution is a fact. It's been 150 years. Mm. Biology, the truth of biology is not pr predicated on being able to convince everyone. I, and, and, and so that's just a, it's, it's just a, a straw man argument. It, uh, I would also add, I mean, to, to, you're absolutely right in what you said, that you, these people are worth reading, but you, they're worth reading with a modern mind. You believe that you, you, as a philosopher, you believe you have more to say about Hume because you're living in the, in the 21st century where, the, the, where human knowledge, the, the, our knowledge of the world allows you to reflect on those same ideas that he was talking about, but with, with a, a, a more prepared and capable mind to do it in principle mm. and that that's the point that I'm saying is that is that we shouldn't take these words on authority they're interesting ideas but we but we've learned something 
and, and, and we should be prepared to, uh, to, to say that they're wrong or we should be prepared to say we now know better. And, and I'm sure that in some sense, as a philosopher, you'd love to write a piece saying we know better than Hume and here's the reason why. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I don't deny that we, we read with, uh, with, a, with more um, experienced minds in some ways. We've got other, other sources of authority. We've got other, not other bits of knowledge. Let's expand it a little bit to think about literature as you were just doing there. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. Um, the, how many of you, does the name John Kutzea mean anything to you? J.M. Kutzea, C-O-E-T-Z-E-E, -E, oh, yeah. is a uh, Nobel Prize winning um, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, I don't pronounce it that way. writer uh, with one of his books was called Elizabeth Costello, one called Disgrace, recently Summertime. Um, there is a volume out now actually called John Kutzea and Ethics. And um, two of chapters, a, a, a book, uh, a, a short novella called The Lives of Animals, which is from his novel Elizabeth Costello, was actually his presentation as some lectures at Princeton. Um, you were a respondent, uh, Amy, Doniger was, Amy Gutman was there, Wendy Doniger and so on. Um, could you speak to this point? Because I think it's rather an important one. I'm sorry, what is... The, 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 the question, the, 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 the intersection of literature yes. and ethics and whether you can find any, um, anything of value uh, about this question, oh, well, well, the question about morality in here and so on. Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly I think we can. Um, obviously, you know, I think uh, Simon mentioned uh, writers like, like Tolstoy or any of the uh, Shakespeare, we can read them and through them we can learn to understand uh, what things are like for other people that we might not have grasped. Um, that's obviously valuable. Um, Kutzea, I think, does that. You know, I think what's distinctive about many of his novels is that they pose deep moral questions for us and that they present uh, sometimes quite explicitly, as in Elizabeth Costello when she's talking about animals yeah. and the that. suffering that we wrongly inflict on animals, sometimes more implicitly in terms of building the context of the, the situation, as in disgrace, for example, um, we, we are led to think about these questions in a particular context. Um, and I think that that is clearly enlightening. Um, now, I don't think, you know, if, if we are taking science in this very wide sense, I don't think it's contrary to, to what Sam would be suggesting. It's a way of gaining insight and perhaps it doesn't test it in a rigorous way, but it provides insights which we might want to explore further on. Yeah, and I, I wanted so. then to weave that also, and we're coming to a close now, to, to, to Steve, because in Steve's presentation today where you were actually talking about the escalator of reason, you were talking about things improving, you were talking about the decline of violence, one of the things that you uh, suggested as a factor in there was in fact the prevalence and the increase of, of, of novels and so on, being able to put yourself in somebody else's uh, mental yeah. shoes and so on. So could you, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, there is, there is a, when, when you ask what are the developments that led to the measurable moral progress that our civilization has enjoyed, such as the abolition of slavery and torture and cruelty to animals, one could make the case that uh, an increase in literacy, including the consumption of realistic uh, fiction, played a role. Uh, what many novelists do is what many moral philosophers do, that is, come up with a thought experiment, a hypothetical scenario, sometimes preposterous, that clarifies moral intuitions. And I think a lot of uh, fiction does that for us, more artfully perhaps than, uh, although maybe less precisely than the typical philosophical thought experiment. Uh, I mean, just one example is the sequence in uh, Huckleberry Finn, in which uh, Huck is uh, racked with guilt over the terrible thing that's been uh, paining his conscience, namely that he ran away with a slave who was someone else's uh, property. And what did that slave owner ever do to poor Huck that he would, would be so treacherous as to steal his slave. And then finally Huck says, oh, well, I guess I'm a morally imperfect person. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn uh, Jim in. Now, that's a wonderful way of tweaking our intuitions as to whether moral uh, conviction necessarily leads to morally praiseworthy uh, uh, conclusions. So one way, that's just one of many examples, I think, in great fiction that pushes our moral intuitions via thought experiments. And another is uh, that fiction is a, a, an empathy technology. In order to enjoy 
uh, fiction, you have to uh, project yourself into the life of someone who may be very much uh, unlike you. The rise of the novel in the 18th century did come before the rise of many humanitarian reforms. One can point to specific acts of uh, um, works of fiction that plausibly led to a, an expansion of concern. Maybe the most famous example was Uncle Tom's Cabin, which at least according to Lincoln. legend, uh, when Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, so you're the little lady that started this big war. And there are many other examples in which consciousness of the suffering of a forgotten class of people, or indeed animals, came from reading first-person accounts of what it's like to be that person or that animal. Uh, this is all anecdotal and plausible, but there are experiments uh, initiated by Daniel Batson and others where if you bring someone in the lab and have them uh, take the viewpoint of someone when you read their words, you do become measurably more sympathetic to the author of those words and to people in the same class, say uh, uh, AIDS victims or drug addicts. So it's a little bit of experimental support behind the somewhat sentimental notion that uh, reading fiction genuinely is morally uplifting. I, I want to just jump in here, it, partly because uh, we're paying for it, but, but um, uh, that one, you all received this notice about science and culture, that an origins event that's a four-day event celebrating science and culture in, in April. And, and one of the reasons we're involved, it, it, I want to come back in, in, in some sense to say that, to, to me at least, one of the things that makes science so worthwhile is not that it produces technology, but it resembles art, literature, drama, all of which have value by forcing us to reassess our place in the cosmos. That's why we like great literature. It forces us to see the world a new way. To me, uh, and to many of us, that's the value of science, is it does the same thing. And so bringing them together is a natural thing, and that's one of the reasons why we're going to celebrate it in April. That's all I want to say. That's good. And I mean, just going back to, uh, to, to Bronowski for you, um, at the, in The Ascent of Man when he's at the pool at Auschwitz, he's talking about science, and he says that science is a very human form of knowledge. We're always at the brink of the known. We always feel forward for what is to be hoped. Every judgment in science stands on the edge of error and is personal. Science is a tribute to what we can know, although we are fallible. In the end, the words were said by Oliver Cromwell, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. So, your final vote. <laughs> Can science tell us right from wrong? Those who say yes. We hate it. And those who say no? <laughs> I think you changed some minds. That's, uh, I think that's a healthy, flourishing situation to be in. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Roger.